This episode is sponsored by our friends at Y Charts. If you're an advisor, you know just how many hats you have to wear. Sales, marketing, portfolio management, relationship building, accounting, a dozen other functions that fall on your plate, often all at the same time. That's where YCharts steps in. YCharts is a one-stop shop for all your investing research and client communication needs. With its intuitive interface, pre-built research templates, and custom reporting tools, you'll save hours of time each week and be equipped with the tools and data you need to uncover better and newer investing ideas. Visit go.ycharts.com slash meb2023 or click the link in the show notes to start your free YCharts trial and get 20% off your initial subscription. New customers only. Dennis, welcome to the show. Meb, it's a pleasure to be here. It's been too many years, so I'm looking forward to it. Just got back from two weeks on the road, so I'm a little out of sorts. Where were you at? So my family, my mom's side is from North Carolina. So they do an annual, it's like salmon, an annual trip back to this tiny little beach called Topsail Island. It has like one road. So we went there, saw a bunch of family, Winston-Salem. You ever been to North Carolina? Well, I went to Clemson, so I spent a lot of time in the Carolina. I have some funny Clemson stories, man. Once you get past cousin, I can never tell what the relations are. It's like my great uncle or something, you know, once removed, what, 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 blah, blah, blah. But he was a Clemson guy. And I have some very just, he was kind of a, a little bit of a, a deviant. He liked to play tricks on everyone. And he's old, he was older at the time. So let's call him, you know, 70 uh, when I was a kid. But he's the type of guy, like we'd be going to church Sunday morning and he would come up and squirt the kids with invisible ink all over their shirt. I mean, not invisible ink, yeah, disappearing ink. So the kids would be like crying because they're getting ready to go to church, like this type of guy. But I have a very distinct memory of driving to a Clemson Carolina football game years ago when I think Clemson was good the first time around and Carolina was terrible. But he just marched right up to the press parking and said, hey, you know, we're, I'm Clemson Press. And the young girl said, you know, do you have a badge? And he said, no, you know, but, but like the authority and confidence that only a 70 year old could have who was absolutely not a journalist. And they let us write in. And I remember saying, Goody, and that was his name, Goody. Goody, not sure what lesson to take away from this, my great uncle. <laughs> but they did a really funny practical joke on all of our Carolina UNC family where he got giant Clemson paw prints and at night in Chapel Hill went with orange paint and did them through the streets all all through Chapel Hill. And (laughs) there were certain, I mean, this is back probably, you know, 50 years ago, I think before I was around. So there was 70 years, I don't even know at this point, but they were around for a while. Like they didn't just come and pave them or clean them off the next day. These uh, giant paw prints were there for, I think, many years. But the best part is they never you know, try to, they try to be anonymous, but they had the paw prints leading up to my great aunt's house or whatever his, his cousin, whatever it was. So anyway. Well, I always felt when the Clemson Carolina game took place that um, everything changed. I mean, it literally like the sky color changed and every, it is just that the, the whole atmosphere, uh, there's no other day like that. I mean, there's no other football game or anything else you could go there that would give you that. It was just a, the the whole place felt completely different. I remember getting receiving two dollar bills when I was a kid. Never seen a two dollar bill, but it had two orange paw prints on them. So I just like assumed they came. That's what came on a two dollar bill. <laughs> Probably still have those somewhere. I don't even know the answer to this. How'd you end up in Clemson? Oh, just uh, very random. When when my brother and I were coming to the U.S. for for studying, we had one distant relative. And my parents asked, hey, the boys are coming, what schools? This guy had done his PhD in Clemson. No, he said, oh, of course they should come to Clemson. So funny. And you know, so that's how I ended up there. And I actually never realized, you know, like, uh, you know, I got parachuted into Clemson from Dubai and India. And uh, I actually never realized a couple of things. One is how pretty that part of the country was till I left. Uh, because I just assumed this was the U.S. and all of the U.S. was like this. In a slightly different, you know, multiverse timeline, you would end up being agriculture guy. Like that was a, that was a very big ag school, right? Sure, yeah. How did you not end up being a farmer? Uh, that could have been a, a, a different path for you. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, I, I actually didn't even know what to study. People said computers are hard, so I, I studied uh, computer engineering, and that was that. And I just kind of drifted through. I really didn't have a good idea what I should be doing or what I should be studying. So I was just, you know, open to suggestion. Yeah. You know, I mean, when you're 18, 20 years old, whatever it is, as kids, like it, even even then, the idea of what the studying meant, like I wanted to be, I started out in aerospace and then, you know, I looked at my schedule and as an engineer, so I went to Virginia right up the road and they give you a schedule for an engineer because you have to take all these years of requirements. And I am not a morning person. I had five 8 a.m. classes. And I looked at the schedule. I said, what is this? This is all physics and chemistry. I just want to be an astronaut. What does it have to do with aerospace engineering? So little do you know what things end up being when you're that young. But the same thing, like it is investing. Like if you were to ask me probably what an equity was when I was high school age, I'd probably say, what do you like? Something on the menu for lunch? I don't know. Yeah. And one of the one of the things that happened to me at Clemson is I had a deep interest in economics accounting business in general and uh, my father was an entrepreneur so i tried to take as many elective courses as i could in the business school so i used to just look at whatever i could take in the business school just because i just had an interest and i remember i was taking um, an investing class i was like a junior or something i was taking some investing class and um, it was actually, I didn't realize at the time, this was 1985, and you know, the markets has just started to turn, right? I'm 82 on when they started to rise, and uh, the professor got us all a you know, student subscription to the Wall Street Journal, and then I remember we used to like, uh, he was uh, doing these case studies, like Disney, for example, you know, some of the parts, everything was, I mean, I was just surprised how cheap things were. And I had a I had a hundred and six percent average uh, in that class going into the final, and so the professor called me to his office. He said, "You know, I was really surprised. I looked you up that you're not a business major, and you're topping my class." You know, and uh, he said, "Well, so he said I called you here for two reasons." He says, first, you don't need to show up to the final. You have an A." Okay, so you're exempted for the final. I said, okay, that's great. You know, one less uh, class to worry about. And the second is, he said, I think you're in the wrong major. He said, I don't know what kind of engineer you're going to be, but I know you'd be great at investing. And my perspective at that time was that these business school students were so stupid. They were so dumb. It, my perception as a you know 20-year-old was when I used to go and take my engineering classes, you know, I was really challenged. They were really tough classes. But the business school, it came so easy to me with a cakewalk, you know. So I'd say, I can't have a major with these guys, you know, that'd be terrible, you know. So I just said, well, you know, uh, thanks for the input, but I'm just going to stay where it is. And then, you know, after uh, whatever, I think uh, nine or 10 years, nine years after that, eight years after that is when I heard about Buffett for the first time. And then I did a pivot about 13 years after graduating. So it's it's funny, I kind of went and caught the year around like this and sort of just going straight and, you know, uh, that way. So that was kind of funny. I mean, that, that was another like serendipitous, right? You came to Buffett just through grabbing a book, right? I mean, I, I feel like I almost remember like you're all... You're on like an airplane and just grabbing a book or something. I mean, if, I wonder if you end up grabbing some other book, um, maybe a romantic novel or something. You'd be a romance novelist at this point. I don't know. But uh, it's funny. The... No, I think I think it was that I was, you know, I think the data, data, data points were already there when I was doing my undergrad that I really liked the stuff. And it's just that I had a mental block and I didn't know what to do with you know, going into investing or whatever. I knew that I was on a student visa. I needed to get a job. It would be easy as an engineer to get a job. And it's really after a few years when I realized that, no, this, uh, when I especially read the first Buffett biography, I felt like uh, a lot of it was speaking to who I was. And I found a lot of commonality. About eight or nine years before I heard about Buffett, I had started playing bridge and I love playing bridge. And then I find that he's 
even now he's you know playing bridge three four nights a week and bridge really correlates a lot with investing you know so i was always drawn to probabilities math and and you know i, I grew up with the entrepreneur father so i was always you know around business and all that so there's just a mix of all of that just worked for me you know it's funny about the bridge topic because so i'm 46 and i feel like there's like a line somewhere around here where the generation that's slightly older than me all the way through my parents generation like my parents met playing bridge right i have never played bridge in my life i played like every card game i grew up playing my grandmother called it 21 but blackjack and spades and poker and on and on and on, love playing games. And by the way, Monish has a, a request on Twitter listeners for a solid ringer bridge partner. Uh, what, what was the request for this playing the Swiss team or something? What was the? Yeah, yeah. So actually, I just I just spent a week in Chicago. So the uh, ACBL American Contract Bridge League has three national uh, basically conferences every year in the US, spring, uh, spring, summer, and fall. And uh, it's the first time I went to a bridge tournament in like 20 years. I mean, I'd been, you know, busy with the family, playing online, etc. I hadn't gone to actually live bridge in a long time. So I said, you know what, I'm going to take a week off and just go play live bridge. And I, I didn't even know whether I would like it because one of the problems with playing bridge live is it's a lot slower, you know, online, everything, not, it's slower. You have to do it on their timing. You have to go to a particular place. And what I found is that it was a blast. I mean, I really had a great time. And I didn't have a partner, you know, so I had to do a pickup partner at a partnership desk. And I didn't want to, there are two kinds of, I mean, there are many different bridge games, but you can play pairs where you and your partner play a bunch of other people and whatever, or you can play teams. And it would take some time to describe, but it's a four person team. So I had the, the partner, this guy was a good guy from New York. And then every day we were finding two others to make up our Swiss team, uh, which is a particular kind of a game, which is difficult to play online. You really have to play it in person. And Swiss teams is just a blast. You know, basically you're just the format is really good. And so what I felt like I said, what would really enhance this is if I had a regular partner, because in Bridge it takes a long time to build a uh, compatibility and understand what your partner means and all of that it can take years. And uh, so I said, if I can find a great partner and then we can have a great team, you know, four people who actually play two, three times a year at these national tournaments, it would just be a blast, you know? And uh, so the, the funny thing is what really surprised me, I have 188,000 Twitter followers. I have uh, 50,000 followers on LinkedIn and I have about 5,000 on Facebook, okay? Not one person. I sent that, I was shocked. I thought I'd get inundated, okay? And this is a smart investing crowd. I mean, the people who follow me on Twitter are interested in investing and zero. I was just shocked at that. And, uh, you know, even when I go to the bridge tournaments, you see a few young Chinese kids, you know, you see 12 year old Chinese kids, 15 year old Chinese kids, you'd see a couple of Indian nerd kids, but then the rest of the crowd is an over 70, over 80, oxygen tank, over 90. What is the reason? Because there's other games that have translated to the younger crowd. I mean, poker certainly has had its moment. I mean, a lot of interest in clearly games in general. What about bridge? I don't really understand it. I think it's such an amazing game. It's a game that you can never master in your lifetime. It's a game that would give you so much joy and pleasure. So I think the thing is, uh, for the younger crowd, there are so many options uh, that weren't there for your parents. You know, the, the, the range of options with video games and everything else that they can do with all the distractions of the phones and all that. The interest level is not there, which is really sad. It's actually a really good game. It's a wonderful game, and it's a game that will give you a lot of pleasure. You know, I was really surprised that it happened to me. I feel like Forrest Gump that I spent a few years playing bridge with Charlie and his friends. And, you know, I have to pinch myself because that was a blast and a half, you know. And one time, uh, quite accidentally, I played bridge with Warren. 
and uh, and I was, you know, I was the thing with bridge is that when you're playing with someone, you really have to have an understanding, right? The conventions. And Warren and I start playing together online, and there's a chat box. You know, you can you can chat with your partner and others. So I'm like really quickly trying to message him, trying to get his conventions, and uh, he's saying, "Yeah, I kind of play that. I don't play this." And that's and and I'm saying I'm gonna like blow this game so badly that he's never going to have want to have anything to do with me. And uh, we actually and the funny thing is the other two people we're playing with had no idea that it's Warren Buffett playing. Okay, because uh, his handle is T Bone, and people don't know T Bone is Buffett, right? And uh, they do now. Uh, but we but we whipped it. We really really uh, amazingly. I didn't screw up. We did really well. And then. Three days later, I get a message from Buffett's assistant. So when you play online, you can go back and review all the hands. You can do everything. There's a record of it, right? But you can't do live bridge. So I get this long email from his assistant, Debbie, saying, hey, Warren really enjoyed the session with you. And he was really impressed with the play. And especially, you know, board six, you know, the way you, you did the bidding and then the, the kind of end play with the hands and all that. And I said, he's got like, a zillion other things to do. He's going back and reviewing the hands. Come on, T Bone was going through those, and he is saying, "You know, Monish, uh, board four. I don't know. We may have to evict you as the partner. Your bidding was a little suspect. That's funny. Yeah, exactly. Well, I'll try it. I, I've never played, but I love games in general. And by the way, the only tournament I've ever played in, I played in a spades tournament like when I was in college and got absolutely destroyed. We made it through to like the semifinals and got absolutely destroyed by like two 90 year old grandmas. I mean, like it wasn't even close. I, I'm convinced they had some, you know, hand signals, whatever it was, but they absolutely killed us. While we're kind of on this topic of you being in college and learning about investing some of, some of the early days, I want to make sure I leave some time for your initiative, India. I think it's Dashkana, because I think it's phenomenal and fascinating. But leading into that, if you were to go back and, and teach, I mean, I know you do a lot of student Q&As and talks, but you know, one of the things, we don't really teach money in schools in the U.S. It's starting to, I think it's like up to maybe a third of high schools teach some form of personal finance and investing is sort of like a rounding error of that. But what would your kind of idea or advice as you talk to what you know your kids, your friends' kids, college students today? How do you how do you put them on the right path? Or if you're an administrator of Clemson, let's say the the president of Clemson is like Manish, we really gotta you know lay this out the right way. How, how would you think about it? What would you say? Yeah, I mean, I think the correct age to start this is in high school. I think uh, like ninth or tenth grade is just perfect. And it's really a big failing of the education system that it's not given because it wouldn't take much time. It would not be a very long curriculum or course or even a discussion. But the important thing to really get across is the power of compounding. And you know what Einstein says, the eighth wonder of the world. And and the thing about compounding is we are all taught compounding in math. You know, we understand uh, from a math mathematical point of view what it is. But from a money point of view and impact on your life point of view, because it's on a log scale and because of how the numbers change over the decades, no one ever goes through that. So just the simple thing about the rule of 72, about telling people, look, if you have a 10% return a year, your money doubles every seven, seven years. If you have a 7% return, it doubles every 10 years. And even if you get a 7% return, the, the power of starting early, basically it's how many doubles. That's, you know, we, we know that, but uh, the high school kids need to know that. And what is lost in all of this is that if an 18-year-old is fully familiar with this and he knows, he or she knows they have a 60, 70, 80-year runway and the 60 or 70-year runway you know, you're even doing, you know, like 10% a year or something or somewhere around that, you could have close to 10 doubles in a lifetime. 10 doubles is 1,024. I mean, whatever you save at the age of 18 is multiplied by a thousand. If you saved a thousand dollars when you were 18, that would be a million. 
70 years from now. And at 19, you would save some more. At 20, you would save some more. So the important thing about spending less than you earn, putting it into a compounding engine and not messing with it. You know, people have 401ks. They leave jobs. They go to Hawaii. They pull all the money out. They pay a penalty and then it's gone. And then by the time you get to 70 year olds, their 401k is $40,000, you know, or $100,000. And it, it should be in the millions. And so this is such a simple, low hanging fruit. But there's this very obvious challenge, which is 18 year old me wants an iPhone, sick new truck, go out with my friends, I want to go on spring break, new surfboard, whatever it may be. There's the allure and seduction of the hedonic treadmill. Like there's the people that get it. So let's ignore those that there's a certain percentage that hear that statement, they hear you talk to their high school class, and they're like, damn it, I'm in like the the Buffett inoculation, they just they heard it once they're in. But for the vast majority of everyone else, you know, having some sort of like a Thaler nudge behavioral system in place, because a lot of it right now is opt in, you know, as far as retirement. Yeah. So the first thing is it becomes opt out. It becomes opt out. Uh, the, the, the 401k money gets taken out. You don't get to see it. It goes automatically into an index if you do nothing. And you cannot take a loan against it unless it's really important. And there's some real hardship. And it's complicated to opt out. I mean, you just put those pieces in place and the employer match goes in and that you cannot even pull out no matter what. It's too easy to shut off the engine today and or to not even start it. I mean, there's kind of two ideas in my mind. One is, you know, if, if Biden's listening or his crew to this podcast is to kind of move it towards the Australia model where you have to put in 10% or whatever it is into retirement from wages. And that's that. And they love it over there because they've been in it long enough to where they see these massive retirement accounts. But presuming the government's not going to do it, listeners, I think someone I would love to see an app or something like the anti Robin Hood, you know, annuities are in this umbrella, but they're but they have so many historical conflicts of interest and fees. It's just, it's wading through that, but almost like an app that is like, look, you can buy Berkshire, S&P, whatever it is, but you have to hold it for X amount of time or there's a penalty or there's something, right? But like, it's almost like a, a way to incentivize people to, to actually, you know, do it. And there seems to be ways that the capitalism free market could solve this presuming the government doesn't get its act together, but PVD. But also also what doesn't happen today is even when people join 401ks or whatever else, nobody really explains the log logarithmic nature of compounding. They just say, oh, you know, you do this and you get 10% a year or whatever else, and no one really connects the dots. You know, it's uh, that piece is just left hanging to figure it out on your own. and even for me, with uh, you know, I was always great at math and all that. It was surprising, you know, when I would actually studied it and I looked at it and looked at Buffett and looked at what he had been doing. It was a revelation for me. And I mean, I was always good at math and I was always good at probabilities, always understood all that, but I still never really properly understood it. Yeah. Well, let's use that as a segue. I want to hear a little bit about this big school initiative that you've been doing. Well, how long now? Is it 10 years now? Oh, it's uh, it's now 16 years. Wow. I was actually watching one of your YouTube videos, and it's fun because the comment sections, which some reason on YouTube are actually like very pleasant now. I don't know if they've just gotten a handle on part of the ability to filter the messages, but one of them was a, a, met a doctor who said, I had actually been through this program. And I was like, how amazing to read, finally, the, you know, the fruits of doing this for so long. Uh, tell the listeners what I'm talking about and give us kind of an update and overview of uh, what's been going on there. Yeah, actually, our oldest alums now are 32 years old, and uh, they're uh, starting to make their mark, which is uh, really fun to see. But basically, the idea is that we identify uh, very poor kids who are really bright, and we identify them between the age of 16 and 18. And we spend one or two years with them. And we basically prep them for the engineering and medical entrance exams in India. 
And one of the things about India is that the engineering and medical schools are really good. They are run by the government and they are pretty much almost free to attend. Basically, very heavy government subsidy. But getting into those schools is really hard. It's very competitive. So, for example, the IITs, you know, Bill Gates says that if he was only allowed to recruit from one school, he would only recruit from the IIT. So the Indian Institute of Technology. I've worked with a couple of IIT guys, and they are definitely smarter and more capable than I am. I'll give them that. They negotiate every single possible thing in the world, even when you're not even supposed to be negotiating, and I love them to death. And we'll go get a sandwich, and they're like, so six bucks. When you say six bucks, kind of maybe five bucks, I'm like, hey, you don't, you don't have to negotiate the sandwich right now. <laughs> like, we can just buy the sandwich. But extremely capable. Well, there's... 1.3 million kids, 18-year-olds, who take that entrance exam for 16,000 seats. So it's a 1.3% admit rate. And if I look at Princeton, it's a 5% admit rate. Harvard is a 5% admit rate. And the thing is that they will, you know, they give priority to legacies and they give priorities to all kinds of donors and whatever else is going on, which now they're getting clobbered on the head by. But the IIT is a purely a quantitative measure. It doesn't matter if you are the prime minister's son or daughter or the richest person in India, whatever, or how much you're willing to donate. It's based on your test score on that test. That entrance exam test is the hardest test in the world. If you score 34% on that test, you have a seat at IIT. Okay, you just need to get a third correct. Kind of makes me want to take it right now. I'm a little curious to see how it's bad. I was, it's going to remind me of like my physics three classes in college when like an A was like getting like a 25 somehow. And they have negative markings. So the thing is, if you get a wrong answer, they ding you. They take away a quarter point for a wrong answer. So like 70% of test takers end up below zero. <laughs> so they don't even, oh my god they, that's so dude, that's so demoralizing they would have been better off just turning in the empty paper you know the score would been higher but anyway the thing is that we identify these kids most of these kids are illiterate parents kind of laborers farmers and so on the parents don't even know what they're doing with the kids and we bring them into a boarding school system so we can completely control because they don't have electricity they don't have a desk they don't have a computer, there's nothing, there's no infrastructure where they're at. And so we bring them to our centers, which are fully equipped, we've got the best faculty, best everything. And we've, we, our testing is really good that we identify that they have horsepower. And then we spend two years prepping them for the test. And so the, the national admit rate is 1.3%. Our success rate is north of 60%. And actually, if I take, include the next level of schools, the NITs, which are right below the IITs, it's over 90%. What is the lag time on how long they're in the program? Is it like six years? Is it two years? They are with us for two years, and then they go into the IITs for a standard four-year undergraduate degree. So basically, we usually start with them at 16. We're done at 18. Uh, they finish with the IITs at 22, and then they enter the workforce, and then we go from there. And basically, they've been recruited, our kids have been recruited straight from the IIT campuses, directly by Google and Microsoft and Amazon and all of these companies all over the world. They end up with Samsung in Korea and, uh, you know, different companies in Singapore and all over the place. And of course, all over India as well. And, uh, you know, these kids are coming from kind of less than $3 a day kind of family income. It's very, very low income. And so they go from something like $1,000 a year of family income to 150, 200,000 when they start. It's a huge reset. And uh, so from my point of view, you know, it's a real zero to hero. The return on invested capital, social return on invested capital is off the charts. And one of the things that makes Dakshana work so well is it costs us about three grand to take a kid through the two-year program, the boarding, lodging, and everything. The subsidies from the government, in effect, is a 25 to 1 match. So our 3,000 unlocks about 75,000 in government subsidy because 
that's the cost of the IIT degree that the government is paying for. So we are able to lift these families from poverty permanently. It looks like a magic bullet. You could spend 3,000 and suddenly the bag making 150,000. But that's because there's another 75,000 of spending. So the 25 to 1 match is really what makes it work so well. And I think I've heard you say, you know, you guys are starting to be a non-trivial percentage of the IIT intake each year. How many students are kind of going through the program per year now or aggregate in total? Every year we have about a thousand graduates. And uh, so we are, we are taking about 4% or so of the IIT seats currently and similar number of medical seats currently. And when we get to about 12 or 13%, we'll pretty much max out. It's very competitive. You know, there are a lot of rich people with a lot of resources going after these seats with a lot of uh, brain power as well. So we will not be able to take more than like one in eight seats or something. What's been the response from locally in India? Obviously, the communities which are involved in it, it's probably universally positive. Has Modi reached out and been like, hey, man, this is amazing. We got to help you out on this path. We see that you're doing uh, God's work. What's been the response from government, corporations, kind of just people, boots on the ground? Well, for, for the entire 16 years, we've had a huge relationship with the government. So we work with the largest magnet school system in India, which is a government school system in rural India, we actually could not do the work if we were not tied into them because they are really sourcing these kids in sixth grade from all over the place in India with the language and vernacular. So the government actually has been very supportive. I mean, it's been a great partnership. And uh, Dakshina, we don't really focus on uh, trying to get a lot of pats on the back or whatever else. So we just, you know, put our head down and get the work done. And we do get accolades from Modi and others, and that's fine. But it's all about the inner scorecard, right? You know, we just want to basically do our do our work and do the best we can and uh, let the chips fall where they may, you know. Well, you get about another uh, generation, 10 years of these, and you're going to have a bunch of these graduates starting to percolate through the ranks of corporate and uh, government in India anyway. So we'll just have a pabri army of well-equipped and uh, grateful. Uh, and some of our kids, uh, some of our kids have already dropped out of uh, undergrad. They got funded by Y Combinator and all these, you know, top end VCs. Some are already on their second startup and so on. So I, I think in... 10 or 15 years, we'll start seeing some amazing stories. Uh, you know, we're already seeing people, like we have we have a, a kid at Google and when Sundar does his IO presentation, he's a part of that. You know, he's, some of those slides are done by him. So they're already starting to make some waves, which is great. We talk a lot about startup investing here and, you know, having been doing that for a while, there's a trend maybe about half a decade ago where I really started to see a lot of companies because the Y Combinator template has like spread around the world. And so you're starting to see now that you have this kind of templated documents and way to go about the funding, I mean, it just makes it so much simpler. You're seeing a lot of startups have very real traction in, you know, in India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Africa, Latin America. And it's to the point now, I think for the past few years, the majority or near majority of my startup investments have been X US, but in a lot of these places, which is really fun to watch. You know, my idea, I and this isn't, I don't, I don't take credit for this, but given all the shenanigans and revelations going on, which I feel like everyone has always known in the university system in the US, I said, I, I'm, I'm waiting for like a top 100 college, you know, it's not gonna be one of the top 10. But to just say, you know what, we're just gonna be honest about this. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna auction off the top 100 spots. So we're, we're bringing in 10,000 a year. So top 100, you get in no matter what, but it's gonna be a blind auction. So you know, you don't have to name a building, we don't want your name on the building. We'll do a blind auction. Top 100 get in no matter what, but we'll be honest about it. And to me, it seems like a much more a transparent way to go about these these crazy college admissions besides all the scandals and, and nonsense that goes on today. But I like the pure merit base too. That makes a lot of sense. No, but I think I think your idea is a, is a good one. I mean, I think bottom line is that college education is a lot more expensive than what the tuitions you can charge and should charge. And so it does need 
in some ways to be subsidized by the rich. And uh, so, yeah, you can you can give some quid pro quo to the rich, but I think the more straightforward and uh, transparent you make it, the better it is. Yeah. All right. Well, listeners, when we were prepping for this interview, I'm going to sit over a couple criteria, which I have actually never heard before. He said, I want to hear some hard questions and questions I've never been asked before. So I said, okay, we'll take up that challenge. So we're going to use some of these. This may not be a linear progression, but they could be jumping off points. And some of these answers may only last for a minute and some could be a half an hour conversation. So we'll just see where this leads us. But I have a theory and I'm pretty sure you've never been asked this question, but every portfolio manager of maybe the last 50 years who has opted into this decision, I believe, has had their best performance, which is, if you look back, Bill Gross, Muhammad Al-Aryan, trying to think who else, Soros ever having a mustache, that portfolio, male portfolio managers, when they had mustaches, were their best performing years than when they were clean shaven. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you see what I'm talking about. If you're watching, if you're listening to this on podcast, Linish has a beautiful duster right now. Do you find any correlation? Have you been putting up better years with than without mustache? Because you've been clean shaven before, right? Yeah, I actually didn't didn't have a mustache until about eight or nine years ago, maybe ten years ago. But uh, I have never been asked that question before, Mev. So thank you, congratulations. We're gonna have to go through the annual Christmas cards and say, did he have a mustache? And then look at the returns for the year, and then we'll do a, we'll do a regression analysis and we'll see what the answer is. But I feel like uh, I have a pretty high hit rate on this. I would say, from in in my case, there's no direct correlation. So sorry to disappoint you in that, but maybe we don't have enough data. We'll put some IIT interns on this and we'll see what they can come up with. We don't have enough data because the mustache years are short relative to the non-mustache years. So, well, I was Googling and you'll probably know better than I was. I was trying to find some uh, pictures of Warren Buffett or Charlie if they ever had a mustache. I don't think they have. They yeah, were... Charlie and Warren, there was only one time and Warren went to some kind of a surgery and he was in the hospital for two, three weeks where he actually grew a beard. And that's the only time when he didn't shave, you know, but, and Charlie, I've never seen that. That's probably when Berkshire paid their one and only dividend too, right? He's like in the hospital, came back. He's like, what's going on here? I got a beard. You guys are paying dividends. Well, I figured we would start, you know, you, like many, there's some non-consensus views. One of my favorite Twitter threads that we ask people in this uh, is to say, what is something, a view that you hold personally about investing that the vast majority of your peers do not hold. So let's talk about like 70, 70%, two thirds, 75%, that if you said this today, almost everyone would be like, I absolutely do not agree with you on this. Is there anything that comes to mind? Well, there's uh, several that come to mind. Well, the first, the first one that comes to mind would be investing in a place like Turkey. You know, we've I've been, I've been going there for about five years and, uh, I've talked to a lot of smart investors about what I think were total no-brainer investments, and uh, they can't get past the country. You know, they, uh, I can't even get to the, to the company. The second thing, which took me uh, also a long time to figure out, and uh, you know, I realized actually this year when Buffett's letter came out, is even Warren Buffett has only made most of his money on about 4% of the bets that he's made. It's one out of 25 bets that has moved the needle for him. And this is Warren Buffett, you know, doesn't make mistakes and is so particular and so careful. And so investing is a kind of very unusual art where it can tolerate a very high error rate, but in order for it to work with a very high error rate, you have to have held the ones that you truly had high conviction and, and uh, truly understood for a very long time. And so, you know, I think the, the, one of the extreme cases of this is uh, Shelby Davis, you know, the Davis dynasty. And uh, Shelby was very early in investing in international insurance companies and he bought a zillion of them. I mean, like, you know, lots, lots and lots and lots of bets. They were not concentrated bets. Um, you know, a lot of them were less than 1% of the assets he were managing. And 
almost nothing worked. But the Davis dynasty, they, they got and they ended up with a very large net worth because one worked. They were very early in AIG. And uh, they just, and the thing is, whether he made a great bet or a lousy bet, he just kept them all. He never sold. And so the one great bet, which was AIG, which was less than 2% of the total amount of money they had, ended up becoming 80, 90% of the fortune. And uh, it was a big fortune. And so basically this particular notion about investing, which is, I mean, anytime we look at a business, we have a view on what it would look like five years, 10 years, 15 years from now. And most of the time, we're going to be wrong. That's just the real candid answer on that. And sometimes you'll be right. But to actually, you know, harness and collect the fruits of that labor, you have to held all the, have, have held all the wrong and the rights for a very long time. And that's when people get into trouble because, you know, most mutual funds, they're going in and out of stocks all the time and, and all of that. And, and the index, you know, the index does so well because it's too dumb to know that it owns Microsoft and too dumb to sell Microsoft, too dumb to sell Google, too dumb to sell Facebook. And it just ends up in a place where, you know, these great businesses stick in the, the only time the S&P throws a company out of the portfolio is when it's so long in the tooth that it's obvious. You know, they'll never throw out a Google until Google's lost it completely. You know, th this concept of these power law investing, you know, there's two groups that really understand this. You know, I, I think my startup VC friends really get it because by definition, they can't sell, right? So they invest in 20 companies, they get that one or two is going to drive the returns of the entire fund. My quant trend followers get this because they've modeled it out and they see, hey, our batting average is like 30%. But that one trade on euro dollar or wheat or short bonds or whatever it was makes up for all the losers. A lot of the public market friends, you know, I think there's a phrase, and maybe this Jerry Parker, but they're essentially, I'm going to get it wrong, fearful with gains, but hopeful with losses. And, and so the, as if they get a double or a triple, like, oh, my God, this is amazing, you know, best thing ever. But every 10 bagger, 100 bagger at one point was a triple. And I think the, the challenge of holding things for very long, and there's a couple good books on this, 100 Baggers and 101 in the Stock Market, I think is hard, obviously, because of the drawdowns, but also because you get to a point, and I'd love to hear your perspective on this, because Twitter obviously loves to chime in. You know, Warren and Charlie have a massive concentrated holding now. And this sucker, Apple, historically, I think every decade has had at least a 50% drawdown, I think with the exception of the last one, and one over, I think, 80. How do you think about it? I think the mental model you have to use is you have to think of yourself as the founder or the entrepreneur. So if I look at the Walton family, you know, they are the only ones who've held Walmart from 1970 till today. And uh, they held it after Sam, Sam Walton was gone. They held it when there were no Waltons running the place. There's no, I, don't, I think there might be one Walton on the board or something. And they've had no control over this business. And they've held it for this entire period. And so why should an investor use a different framework from an entrepreneur? So we see this all the time, right? You, you see entrepreneurs have 99% of their wealth in the business they created. And they go to sleep at night very comfortable with that. You know, and uh, you know, people say, well, they got control. Well, control is overrated. It's not really the control. Uh, so I think, I think that the framework we have to use is to think of ourselves as if we are not the founder, we are basically an owner or a partner. So think of it as a partnership in a private enterprise, you know. And so I think that once you make that shift where you say that, you know, this is a family business and I own 30% of the business, I'm not the founder, but I have a significant stake and I understand the business, then those two, you know, the investor and the entrepreneur start blending. And uh, I mean, we see this over and over. You see the IKEA guy, 
right? I mean, basically, he put the entire company into a foundation. But, you know, 99.99% of his net worth was IKEA. And, uh, you know, we just see that with all these entrepreneurs all over the place. And they remain comfortable. If you look at the Google guys, you know, they, they stepped aside, uh, but they kept their stake and perfectly okay. Do you think Berkshire, let's say uh, Warren says, all right, Ted and Todd, they're awesome, Manish, we, we need your help too. What do you think we should do with Apple? This is a big, big stinking part of our portfolio. Warren's like, you know, he wouldn't say this, but I don't want to have another 1999 Coke where this thing is probably expensive. I just may, you know, the taxes, I don't want to pay taxes. This is a good business, great franchise. What do you think you would do in their their seat at this point? Would you uh, would you start to trim this big position, or would you hold on thinking this might be the world's first ten trillion dollar company? I think first five trillion too. I don't think we have a five trillion yet, do we? Well, so I think the framework the framework you use when you are an, a large owner of Apple, or let's say the founder of Apple, let's say Steve Jobs' widow, for example, is not to do anything till there is a permanent secular decline. And we, real, we realize that we will not be able to cash out at the top when there is permanent secular decline. Everything at the end is going to go south. You know, that's just the nature of capitalism. I don't see anything on the horizon that is a concern for Apple for the next five or 10 years at least, and maybe beyond. So the, the simple math that I would do with, if I was at Berkshire and Someone, you know, Warren asked me this question, et cetera. I would just say, do nothing. And the way I look at it with Berkshire is they made a $2 billion investment in mid-American energy, which is today approaching $100 billion. It's a 50-bagger. Their railroad investment is huge. And they're sitting on a, you know, $130, $140 billion, And there's $30 billion a year coming in. I mean, if you look at the entire enterprise, Apple is maybe a fifth of the pie you know, fourth or fifth of the pie. We don't see any issues right now. Leave it alone. Focus on the money that's coming in and putting that to work. And even if you take a situation where at some point that value declines, there are other engines there. There are other things going on there. So I think that the framework has to be that you give it a very long leash, uh, just like the Walton family and so on. Okay, you say, okay, I'm not going to tell you to sell... Apple, however, Turkey. Now, we love foreign markets. I spend an inordinate time talking about investing beyond our own shores. Walk us through a little bit how a guy whose first checklist rule is circle of competence, right? How did this guy get interested in Turkey of all places? What was the inspiration? Were you just vacationing and you're like, man, the food here is wonderful, beautiful, great country. Let me go Jim Rogers style, go check in on some businesses. How, how'd you come around to uh, the Turkey interest and how much other foreign investing had you been doing at this point? Was it a large part of the investing strategy or walk us through kind of how it happened? Well, I mean, I think before Turkey, I had been investing in, in India. I had been making trips to Korea. I had looked at things in China, looked at things in Japan and so on. But what caught my eye in Turkey in 2018 was their ratio of GDP to market cap. And the GDP to market cap is not a, you know, you know, it's not something you can always hang your hat on. But there is a correlation, you know, basically a certain amount of the country's wealth is in the publicly traded companies. I mean, if you look at the US GDP and US market caps, U.S. is more than 100% of GDP, is a public trade market caps in the U.S. In, in Turkey, it was a small fraction, a relatively very small fraction. And the second thing I noticed is that everyone had exited. Everyone and their brother had, I mean, these uh, foreign funds, etc., had left the country. And uh, so I happen to have a very good friend who's a very diehard, Graham investor. You know, he comes to Omaha and he's very well-versed in Buffett and Graham and Munger, but though he's too overdosed on Graham, I'm trying to 
move him over to Bunker, making a little bit of progress, but not enough. So I told him in 2018 that, listen, I'd like to come to Istanbul. And uh, I know the food's great. We're going to have a good time. But I just want to visit companies that you have in your portfolio. Don't take me to companies that you don't have an investment in. And I want, you, I want to visit the businesses that have the largest positions in your fund. And would you be okay with doing that? He said, oh, yeah, it'd be a blast. Okay. So I... I still remember the first uh, day we were going to visit the first business. And uh, he tells me, uh, Monish, the PE is 0.1. Not a PE of one. A 0.1 means that the company is going to earn its entire market cap in one month. I said, uh, does it have hair on it? He said, yeah, it has a little bit of hair on it. I said, what kind of hair does it have on it? So it turns out it was one of the largest banks in Turkey. And they had been violating the UN uh, sanctions against Iran. And they were facilitating all these transactions with Iran. They were not supposed to do that. And the US got wind of that. And they were really pissed off. And the CFO of the bank, who really didn't have a whole lot to do with all of this, it was the chairman driving all this, had come to the US to vacation with his kids, Disneyland, uh, Disney World, actually. And the feds picked him up in New York while the rest of his family watched and they put him straight in Rikers prison. And then Erdogan is calling Trump and telling him, you got to let this guy go. And Trump is saying, it's the state of New York that's going after this. It's not me. I can't do anything. They don't listen to me. And then in the meantime, the company is trading on the market and the U.S. is thinking of just taking them off the international, you know, SWIFT system and everything else. So I went to that meeting. It a very well-run bank. And I told my friend, this is too much hair for me. I can't go there. Can we just take it down a notch? We, we can't be doing 0.1 P. At least take me to P or 1, you know. And uh, But what I, what I found in, uh, in Turkey is that there was very high inflation uh, that, that was going to persist and continue. But there were a set of businesses which were not affected at all. In fact, some of them had tailwinds because of inflation and the baby got thrown out of the bathwater, like uh, no one was interested. So then I just looked at those businesses and I had a lot of cover because my friend knew the families, knew where the skeletons were. I mean, he'd really studied these businesses a lot. And so I had like a great unpaid analyst on the ground and, uh, we didn't do a whole lot. I mean, if I look today, I've made, I've made so many trips to Turkey. We have three investments. That's it. We have three investments in Turkey after probably having visited about 80 or 90 businesses there over the years. And uh, the three companies don't really have any correlation with Turkish inflation or anything else. In fact, one of them gets a tailwind from it because their revenues are in euros and all the costs are in lira. So they actually get tailwinds from inflation. And they were very strong businesses. So for example, there's a Coke bottler in Turkey. And uh, not only do they bottle Coke exclusively in Turkey, they do it in about a dozen other countries. And they have a very good relationship with the Coca-Cola company. Coca-Cola company owns 20% of the business, sits on the board. And you can look at Coke bottlers around the world. The economics are very similar. They should trade at similar multiples. You know, everything is, if the growth rates are different, you can put different multiples on them. This thing was an outlier. And, you know, the Coke bottler, only about a third of their volume, maybe 35% or 40% was coming from Turkey. The rest was coming from things that have nothing to do with Turkey. They're the largest Coke bottler in Pakistan. I mean, they're the only Coke bottler in Pakistan, for example, and so it's huge volumes. So basically what I, what I found is that there were a sliver of businesses there that no one was interested in. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, we invested in a warehouse company. I still couldn't believe it, but the liquidation value was like six or 700 million and the market cap was 20 million. We just couldn't, I just couldn't understand that. It was just crazy. We hear the same three or four tropes every time we talk about foreign markets. But the two big ones is, you know, people get so caught up in the macro and so many investors get sidelined by it because 
they see what's going on with the currency or they see what's going on with the government or they see what's going on, all these list of things that, in our opinion, is is can be controlled. How do you think about, broadly speaking, the currency side of it? Is it something you hedge at all? Or you mentioned some have even more complicated and even beneficial, you know, parts of the hedging type of thoughts. But what, what, how much of the macro picture plays in for you guys on either dissuading you or obviously it didn't because you do it. But, but if someone is asking this question, I'm trying to get to it. But how do you think about the macro in places like this? Well, I mean, uh, the, we've never hedged uh, currency anywhere. And uh, in some places, like in Turkey or India, et cetera, it would be quite expensive. And actually, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to do it for very long. So it would be somewhat impractical. Well, we, we had a view that the currency would continue to devalue quite significantly. And that, uh, that inflation would be high. It wouldn't go down in any you know, finite period of time. And so... I basically looked at businesses where those conditions were irrelevant. So if I am, you know, bottling Coke, for example, I will get paid a certain amount for someone's labor to give them a Coke. That's basically the deal. The currency is not that relevant. I mean, they're going to be able to adjust it based on what was going on. And in other cases, there were businesses where the revenue just wasn't. I mean, there's a we don't have an investment here, but there's a juice exporter in Turkey where all their revenues are coming from Europe in euros and their costs are all in lira. It's not relevant to them what is happening in the country uh, from a inflation point of view. They actually get tailwinds because uh, their labor costs actually go down because the standard of living goes down with all this inflation. So... I think the macro is important when you have these crazy things going on. And we I just try to kind of sidestep and look at a sliver of things because the baby got thrown out of the backwater. Most of those companies deserve to be clobbered because inflation will clobber everything about them. And so the market is mostly correct about that, but it's not entirely correct. And what I found is, even very smart, rational people I would talk to didn't have an interest. And that's when I could see that, okay, this is a very irrational reaction here uh, because I know these guys are smart, but they're still not willing to even go look at it. Not, not, not invest, but just look at it, you know. Well, Turkish stocks certainly had a monster 2022, which I would also like to point out uh, correlates with the mustache year. Munish. Um, so where else, are, as, you, as you look beyond our borders, are you getting uh, curious about what the Omaha crew is uh, in Japan? Any other countries? How's India look? Any other um, you know places that are interesting right now? Well, usually for me, yeah, India, India is also another good place because it has a lot of secular tailwinds. Uh, you know, the whole China being in the penalty box and all of that is a, is a big tailwind for, for India. And also, it's a, there's a big demographic dividend. It's the only country with large country with a growing population, and so on. And um, but I would say in in any other country other than the U.S., Canada, and India, and maybe some Western European countries, I need ground cover. So I need someone on the ground who really understands Buffett and Munger, and understands the ground realities. And so usually I I'm I can't like you know someone send me some stock in Mexico or something you know unless I have uh, trusted people etc I, I really can't do a whole lot because I think that once you step outside the U.S. borders governance becomes a really big issue the people become a really big issue and what I found what I found in Turkey is um, in these businesses we invested in the people running these businesses, some of the highest quality people I've met, just incredible, incredible talent, incredible ethics. I mean, one of the, one of the families in Turkey, that, uh, the one that has the Coke bottle, you know, they have uh, all the McDonald's franchises in Turkey. They have uh, a big uh, joint venture with Am Imbev for beer. 
And I could see why that's the case because they have the most pristine reputation in Turkey. And all these companies, before they would partner with anyone, they do a very extensive due diligence and they had very deep comfort. So basically, it was really important to make sure that the families and the business, the promoters you were dealing with were absolutely the top-notch, highest quality. I think we, we ended up with much higher quality teams and promoters than I would have in the U.S. And those are also an anomaly. You know, they're, they're few and far between. So I think that when I'm looking at foreign markets, these factors, uh, more than macro, uh, the people become a lot more important. We haven't even spent much time on U.S. markets. What's the opportunity set look like you now in the summer of 2023? You find a lot of opportunity. Are you uh, finding a lot of landmines? What do things look like to you? I was having a, a very hard time finding stuff in the U.S. And part of the reason is my own fault is that I'm a cheapskate. And, and, you know, the amazing thing about someone like Warren Buffett is he's still adding to Apple. You know, we had a discussion about whether he should trim at the current market cap. He's still adding. Okay. And he's adding at five times the price he first bought. At. So it's amazing that he's not anchored. It's a great skill to have to be able to do that. I did find uh, a couple of things in the US. I was actually surprised. I found them recently, but we will not talk about it. It'll come out. It'll come out in the next 13F. Well, watch your 13Fs. You know, it's funny is that we both have been longtime followers and curious about the concept of cloning, you know, to me. And Charlie talks about it, I, I think, certainly more than just about anyone. I don't know if Warren talks about it as much, but Charlie talks a lot about that, that, that concept of 13Fs. And I love looking at yours because usually you notice there's not a lot of names on there. I mean, sometimes there's like four. We got, what, Micron, Brookfield. Yeah, we, we just have, I think the last last one, maybe we had two or three names and that was it. I mean, the thing is that we just haven't been able to find stuff. And actually part of it is my problem. Like I think that I didn't fully grasp how strong the tech tailwinds were and how strong, for example, a business like Amazon is. I was surprised that uh, in Omaha this year, uh, at a dinner, I was seated next to Bill Gates and I had two and a half hours with Bill Gates. I was like, you know, okay, this will be fun. And I played a game with him. You know, I said, look, uh, Bill, I'll, I'll mention a name of a company and you tell me whether you'd go long or short or neutral, you know, and he was willing to play the game, you know, and, uh, and he had, uh, I was just surprised at uh, how much insight he had into some of these uh, these tech names and and the way he sliced uh, businesses like like Google versus uh, versus Amazon versus Apple uh, like he was complaining to me he said you know I invested in Berkshire as a hedge against everything else I'm doing and then I see that they have this huge Apple position you know and so what are the you know and and he was actually you know when I asked him about Apple he wasn't a book, you know. He said, look, they they don't do R&D. He said, we do R&D. Google does R&D, not as well. They're kind of loosey-goosey R&D. But Apple is just, you know, it's top-down. It's it's It was designed by Steve to be one guy, you know, driving everything. And it's a very different company than uh, uh, something like uh, Amazon is. You know, Amazon, I think, uh, if I look at, for example, Facebook and Amazon, compare them, you know, they will put a lot of stuff, throw a lot of stuff against the wall in Amazon and a lot of small bets. And then they watch and then they nurture the ones that are getting traction. But when you have things like fire that uh, Bezos loves, he'll bury it. Doesn't get traction, he'll bury it. And you look at some, someone like Facebook, it's one big bet. You know, it's one big bet on the metaverse. And between the two, I would just, I just want to do it the Amazon way. I don't want to do it the Facebook way. That's just all or none. And Mark has gotten that message now. I mean, now he's become a hardcore, you know, cut the costs and, you know, show me the money kind of guy, which is great. But it was fascinating to, 
hear it from from Bill in terms of these different companies, even the even the semiconductor companies. I mean, he had a he gave me a twenty minute lecture on ASML and the technology of ASML. You know, I mean, he just knows it down to the nitty gritty, which is uh, really uh, really impressive. But I can tell you what he would do. He would go long Amazon. Uh, he would definitely go long Microsoft, and he would go long AMD. Those were his picks. And uh, well, and he's also famous because Elon keeps whining about it. He's very famously short Tesla, or has been, because Elon's always like, "When are you going to close out this Tesla short position?" It's like you know, <laughs> on Twitter all the time. Yeah, I think that's uh, the, the whole shorting thing is a little bit dumb. And and I think shorting someone like Elon is very dumb. On the hundreds, thousands, maybe, of investments you've done in your career, what's been the most memorable? Doesn't have to be the best, doesn't have to be the worst, but just the one that pops in your head is the most memorable investment uh, for you. Well, you know, uh, the thing is that what, what I have always found interesting is the anomalies, you know. So, so for example, I remember in about, I think it was like 2004 or so, in 2004, there's a steel company uh, based in Canada called Ipsco. And uh, Ipsco had no debt. It had uh, $15 a share in cash. And it had a given guidance that the next two years' earnings were going to be $15 a share each for the next two years. So there was $30 of earnings coming in. The stock was at 42 so I'm saying, okay, and the reason they gave the guidance was they, they used to make these tubular steel pipes where they had contracts with these pipelines where they want to deliver, uh, you know, the pipelines had basically given them purchase orders. And so they were going to deliver these pipes and the cash flows were guaranteed. It's not like they were giving guidance based on future sales to be done. These were sales that were already done. So I said, okay, you know, I don't know what will happen after two years. But I know that I, after two years, there'll be $45 of cash on the balance sheet, no debt. And the stock price currently is 42. I said, I just want to see what the stock price is two years from now. I want to see what Mr. Market does with this. And I just bought it based on that notion, right? And a year later, the company announces that we have one more year of visibility and we'll have another $15 a share in earnings for one more year. And now the stock is at about, 70 or 80 it's gone up a bit okay and i'm thinking about well you know we don't it's a steel company it go to zero whatever it's a very cyclical business and and then it starts drifting close to 90 and i'm thinking of you know taking it off like i said the double in 15 months is really good you know let's move on and then i wake up one morning and the stocks at once 157 and some swedish company offered to buy them at 160 and about five minutes after that, I unloaded the stock. I said, we don't need to wait for the last $3. We're done. And uh, recently, the two stocks I found in the U.S., which I got very excited about, are like that. I never thought I'd find that again, where it's this kind of an anomaly where the guaranteed cash flows are exceeding the market cap and all of that. And I remember a couple of years before that, in 2001, so I had read a long time ago that the lowest rate of business failure of any kind of business that you can have is funeral homes. So if you really want to have a guaranteed long-term successful business, just buy a existing funeral home that's doing okay. And nobody goes into the funeral home business. Nobody takes a low bid when their favorite uncle dies. You just want it done right, okay? So they have no cost pressures. They have no margin pressures. There's nothing. And I thought, okay, wow, I read that. I said, okay, that's interesting that the funeral business has got this great characteristics. And then in 2001, I'm reading Value Line. Every, every week I read Value Line. And I read the, I look at one of the areas I look at is the stocks with the lowest fees, right? You know, we can't help ourselves. We always go to the lowest fee stock. And I see two funeral services companies with a PE of two, two of them sitting there, lowest in the value line list. So I said, okay, maybe there's some craziness in the numbers or something. I went back and looked at those companies. They actually had two times earnings, okay? So I said, wait a minute, these, these businesses never fail. 
and it's a two times earnings. And I know that it's a great business. And it turned out both these companies had done big roll ups in the business. They had a lot of debt. There was a concern about the debt. But I said the cash flows are so resilient. You know, we don't know who's going to die next week in Peoria, Illinois, but we know how many are going to die. Okay, there's absolute certainty on that. And um, so I, I bought, I bought uh, Stuart Enterprises, a funeral services company at two times earnings. And, you know, it was eventually at 10 times earnings and uh, got to where it needed to get to. So I think the, 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 the best ones are the anomalies. You know, like I go to Turkey, I go to this meeting and the whole market cap is 20 million and the liquidation value is 700 million. And, you know, you scratch your head. It just hits you in your head by a two by four. And so those are the ones, those are the ones that really interest me, you know. Your comments, um, I think are more important and profound than, than, you know, it sounds very simplistic, but, but listeners like the, the concept, um, like you don't have to have an opinion on every stock that comes your way. And like, and particularly the ones like Tesla, everyone or Bitcoin, it's not a stock, but, but everyone feels like they have to have an opinion on every single thing and say like, it's very refreshing to simply say, you know what? There's tens of thousands of stocks out there. I don't have to have like Jim Cramer have an opinion on every single one. I can just simply sit there and let them pass by and then, you know, on, on the occasion. Well, like Buffett says, we are in a business with no call strikes. And, you know, you, you're not going to be struck out by letting three three balls go. You can let 3,000 balls go. So we we don't need to know much about anything. And, you know, Charlie brings up his friend, John Ariega, you know, he just invested all his life in real estate one mile around the Stanford campus. That's all he did. Died a billionaire. And then his daughter marries Mark Andreessen. So it's billionaire to the power of billionaire now. <laughs> so anyway, what I'm saying is Ariega, Ariega has such a tiny circle of competence. You know, he didn't even do Bay Area real estate. Okay, he didn't do California real estate. He only did real estate around Stanford. And if you walked with him around the Stanford campus, he could point to any building outside the campus and he'd tell you everything about it. Uh, you know, what it, when it was built, what the rents are, what you could buy it for, everything. You know, and so I think in investing and as well as in entrepreneurship, inch wide and a mile deep is the way to go. You don't want to be an inch deep and a mile wide. And uh, so I think that, uh, yeah, you can pick your spots. You don't need to know everything about everything. You need to know a lot about something a little bit and then and then it works out well. Well, Manish, we kept you long enough. Um, before we let you go, what's the best place for uh, people to kind of check in with you, listen to you, what you're up to? Is Chai with Pabrai the best spot? Chai with Pabrai is good. Uh, my Twitter handle is good. If you're a bridge player, direct message me on twitter we can play together and uh you know linkedin is fine too uh, any of those is, is just fine awesome it's been a blessing to catch up with you buddy uh, hopefully to see you in the real world thanks for joining us today thanks meb it was a pleasure 